Today on Context, we are at Pearson Airport about to head out to Nova Scotia. I've always wanted to tell the story of African Nova Scotians and how they've contributed to the history of this country. They have been here for almost 300 years and yet a lot of us don't understand or know all that they've contributed to this country. So today on Context, Canada's forgotten pioneers. Flight clear for takeoff. So we have finally arrived here at Halifax and we're about to settle into our Airbnb. And I've invited a historian from Dalhousie University to chat with me about the history of African Nova Scotians because I have so many questions. Isaac Saney is a professor at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia and specializes in African studies. So Isaac, explain to me how black people came to Nova Scotia. Yeah. Well, normally when people talk about the first presence of somebody of recorded African ancestry in Canada and in this part of the world, what we now call Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia, people often talk about Matthew da Costa, uh, who is, uh, you know, uh, what we do know of him, he was an interpreter. Uh, what his particular role is, he, uh, seems to be as somebody who was a free person of African ancestry, able to negotiate perhaps in terms of his employment, acting as an interpreter between um, the French and the Mi'kmaq. What's interesting about uh, Matthew da Costa is his presence as ostensibly a person who was free, i.e. unenslaved, runs counter to the overwhelming condition of people of African descent in the Americas at that time. Uh, stolen, kidnapped from Africa, they were in positions of incredible servitude, uh, and, uh, i.e. enslavement, reduced to chattel slavery. And so um, after Matthew da Costa, we know that in Nova Scotia we had a population of enslaved Africans. Okay? We know when Halifax was founded in 1749, uh, uh, as a British, shall we say, intrusion on Mi'kmaq territory, uh, there were a number of enslaved Africans who were there. Some of, uh, we also know there were free people of African descent. Uh, we know very few, if any, of their names and so what We know that the free people of African descent existed in perhaps a precarious situation. And we su suspect that when they're used as, as skilled laborers, as rope makers, as caulkers, right, as sail makers, right, as coopers and so forth, once those skills were no longer required, i.e. they were no longer seen of use uh, to the, the, the elites, to the employers, to the general economy of Halifax, some of them may have been then taken and sold, right, into slavery in places such as uh, New England and places like Boston and so forth. So there is a history of slavery in Nova Scotia. The, in terms of um, people arriving in terms of tremendous numbers, so the, the numbers of enslaved Africans is uh, sometimes put in the estimate of anywhere between three to five. People debate the numbers, right? So there's hundreds, if not uh, low thousands of enslaved Africans here. Slavery never acquired the kind of uh, numbers uh, as in the United States, obviously, and also the economic weight that it had in the United States because of the nature of the economy here. We know that, of course, in the wake of the American War of Independence, right? In the 1770s, 1780s, okay, when it comes to close, we have the arrival of over 3,500 black loyalists. And uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, enslaved Africans and other Africans who are offered their freedom by the British if they join uh, the, the British side. Uh, when they arrive, uh, the promises of land, of support, obviously turn out to be for a variety of reasons, uh, not to be fulfilled, to be specious, and they're reduced to being cheap labor. Highly skilled labor, hired off at perhaps a quarter of the wages a white labor would get, right? And of course, they face a series of measures that circum um, that circumscribe their social rights. So along with super exploitation comes social exclusion, social control. They're not allowed to serve on juries. Uh, increasingly, they're not allowed, for example, to um, engage in certain social activities and so forth, right? Uh, quite often, you know, there's all, all these issues are beginning to, uh, uh, to, to accumulate, right? That begin to demonstrate to them that Nova Scotia, which was the promised land, isn't the promised land as well, right? Then, in July of 1784, the first race riots takes place in North American history. Unemployed white Nova Scotians blame the black loyalists for the lack of employment. And after a delegation of black loyalists go to Britain to plead their case based on the promises set out by the British, 1196 black loyalists decide to leave Nova Scotia in what is the largest Back to Africa movement in history. By the end of the War of 1812, more black people arrive in Nova Scotia, choosing to fight on the British side, joining the already fledgling community of black settlers in the province.
we have these 2,000 who come, okay? They eventually merge with the black loyalist communities that are here, okay? And so we have, in a sense, the beginning of what we call the historic black Nova Scotian community. Africville is one of the most notable black settlements here in Nova Scotia, established in the 1700s. Seaview United Baptist Church was really the core of the community, the central point, like many churches in its community. Well, this is a replica of the original church that used to be here and now the home of the Africville Museum. Carm Robertson is the in-house educator at the Africville Museum. I like to introduce people to the, the site by saying you understand you're standing in a replica mm -hmm. of the church that there was nothing left after, after Africville was destroyed. Artifacts are all that is left of what once was a fledgling community. Residents were rushed out of their homes by city dump trucks. Africville was one of over 50 black communities at one time. Carm, thank you for having us here. It's been a dream to be in this space. Take us back to the beginning. How was Africville formed? Why? What was the reason behind this community? Well, what happened was there was a war in the U.S. between the British and the Americans again, um, on, following on the heels of the American uh, War for Independence. So the second war was the uh, War of 1812. And there were a number of people of African descent who were enslaved in the States. And what the British did was they offered them their freedom if they fought for or supported the British side. So a number of them did. And when the British left the United States, those freed people came with them. And so there were about 2,000 of them who came to Nova Scotia. When they came to Nova Scotia, they settled in rural areas of Nova Scotia, like Dartmouth and Hammonds Plains, where they expected to get land, clear title for their land, and be able to farm and sustain their families. And uh, what happened was the land that they did receive was not conducive to agriculture, and so a splinter group broke off and decided to settle closer to an urban setting, to the city of Halifax, so they could work within the boundaries of the city, but then also have a place where they would be safe to be themselves, and that's how Africville formed. Mm -hmm. When people come to visit the museum, they're, they're under the belief that Africville was sort of just this narrow strip here along the coast, yeah. but it wasn't. It, it was 2.2, approximately 2.2 square kilometers, I believe. So it was quite, quite a lot. It had to sustain 400, family, uh, 400 people. So yeah. describe the community and what it was like in its heyday. Well, in its heyday, there were children abounding. Um, people were out on the water. People were fishing. People mm. were doing things you'd expect to see, like I said, in any community. Tell us about some of the success stories that have come out of Africville. There are a lot of famous people that have come out of this community. Portia White taught here. She taught school because there was a school in Africville until it was torn down. Um, Duke Ellington, a jazz uh, musician, used to come down and jam here all the time, and they say he had a, a friend here. Um, and we've had a boxer, um, George Dixon, who came out of Africville, and he was actually a three-time world champion, and he invented shadow boxing, which is used to train people in Africville. As the I mean, the allegation is that the city just tried to, with the dump coming and the railway, was a, a tactic to push Africville out at, yeah. at, at its early stages before they just pushed the residents out. That's right, it was a tactic. The dump, an incinerator, a bone-crushing facility, an infectious disease hospital up on the top of the hill. Um, yeah, I think it was an agenda. And of course, the media played into that. And a lot of people still today from Halifax, especially in the uh, wider community, in those days, people read the papers, and you believed what you read in the papers. So they believed that the government was helping Africans because that's what they read, and that was the media spin on it. They paid their taxes, but it, they received none of the amenities uh, for paying those taxes. So there were no emergency response teams, fire brigades, police, hmm, hospitals, uh, emergency vehicles, anything. They would not come to Africville and um, they paid their taxes but didn't receive the plumbing and the sewage. They paid their taxes and didn't receive paved roads. So it was like Africville was here, but it wasn't really part of the city to whom they were paying the taxes. Tell us about 
how it got to the point where the community was eventually destroyed. It's like I tell people, if someone gets a, a diagnosis that they're going to, they have a, an illness and they have a year to live, then you deal with it and you have time to uh, incorporate that into your mind. But if that person finds that out and goes to sleep one night, that same night and then the next night they don't wake up, it's a bit of a shock. And that's what happened, I think, with, with Africville. They, there were negotiations, they talked, they had a final Easter service, and then the people were fine. And then it just, in the wee hours of the morning, they tore it down. And that was the heart. It's the heart of many of the black communities throughout Nova Scotia, it's the church, it's the hub. And so they tore the heart out of Africville. Okay, a lot of people say, well, they were relocated. They were not relocated, they were dispersed. They were kicked off the land. I read a story of the fact that when houses were torn down, they would move people's belongings in a garbage truck. Yeah, so that tells you what they thought about the people. They moved them in dump trucks, garbage trucks, and then tore the house right down. So it was like they had no, um, it, it was inhumane. And it, it's like what the United Nations declared in 2004, they declared that what happened to Africville was a crime against humanity. And they asked Canada to, re to address that, and that was 2004, so. Are we still waiting? We're still waiting. <laughs> the Canadian government to address yeah, it? Yeah, I would, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk to me about the apology that came from the city and how this building was erected. Yeah, so in 2010, Peter Kelly, the then mayor of the city, um, apologized to the residents of Africville, and there was a, uh, an event in... Um, what specifically did he apologize for, Carm? I'm, I'm curious. He didn't apologize. He apologized, well, I think if you read uh, the apology, it's an apology for Africville, is what oh. it says. So that can, it's sort of a play on words, yeah. you know. Um, but they never really took responsibility mm. in that apology. People come back often mm. to this community. Yes. Tell me about how it's still a place of community to this day. It is a place of community. And, and when people come and they walk upon this land, even though there was a lot of pain that, that came from the land, you can still feel that energy and mm. that, that the love that was infused in the soil. And there's a calmness that happens to people when they come here, I think. And yes, once a year there's in the park, which belongs to the city, but there is a reunion that happens once a year, usually at the end of July, where descendants of Africville, allies of Africville, they pitch their tents or RVs and people come from different families that used to live in Africville, and they have a picnic out there, a reunion every year. So they can tell the old stories, the elders can be with the youth and the children, and make new stories. Coming up, I speak to two women who are pioneers in their own right. The first black Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia and the first black MLA in this province. In our fast-paced world, context is everything to the stories that are shaping us. We want to go beyond the headlines in our new podcast to create space for meaningful conversations to explore where faith intersects with justice, ethics, culture, and society. We'll be joined by newsmakers, peacemakers, and culture shapers. Join us on all podcast platforms or at contextbeyondtheheadlines.com. Next on my journey in capturing just some of the stories of Canada's forgotten pioneers, I had the honor of sitting down with two notable Canadians. First, Mayanne Francis, the first black female lieutenant governor in Canada, the first black woman to serve in the role in the province of Nova Scotia. Appointed by Prime Minister Stephen Harper, she says her faith is what drove her to accept the role. I knew that it would be a change in my life. Um, it would also be a change in the history of Nova Scotia as well, and also the country. You accomplished something amazing during your time as Lieutenant Governor. Um, you brought to the country, and I think the world, the name Viola Desmond. 
Well, Viola Desmond is a very strong part of history, not just of Nova Scotia, but history of Canada, and I would even say the history of international because there's a lot of lessons to, to learn about Viola. So we know in 1946, um, on November, in, in the month of November, the 10th, Viola was on her way to Cape Breton to expand her business. She was a businesswoman. But anyway, when she was on her way to Cape Breton to expand her business, her car broke down. And what she decided to do was to um, spend some time in a movie theater because the, the mechanics told her that it was going to be quite a long time before she gets the car fixed. Anyway, she sat in a theater and she sat close to the screen because she had poor eyesight. And where she was sitting, um, they came in and said to her, you're not allowed to sit here, you have to sit up in the balcony. And, and she said, oh no, I, I want to sit here. And they said, well, it costs extra. Well, I'll pay you the extra, which was a penny, but they wouldn't accept the penny. And so she refused to, to leave, and they called the police, dragged her out, and she was injured as well, and then thrown in jail. Long story short, she was then convicted of defrauding the government of one cent. And that lasted for 64 years. They had the new government that came into power when I was in office, Daryl Dexter was the premier at the time, he and the attorney general, um, they, they briefed me, interviewed me and so forth and basically um, said that they're, they're going to make that recommendation that we would um, do the royal prerogative of mercy free pardon which is only given to people who are innocent. And the only people that can do that is royalty. And because I was the representative of, of the Queen at the time, then I would be the one that gave her the freedom. And I had indicated in the speech that I delivered at the time, I said, she will be talked about, influenced, researched on for the rest of our days. It is only on rare occasions with the clarity of hindsight that a society comes together to undo the wrongs of the past. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how much it meant as the first black lieutenant governor to be able to play such an instrumental role in mm -hmm. sharing that story that you just said you didn't even know about growing up mm -hmm. in Nova Scotia. Well, I can't help but say again it was God's call mm -hmm. because she was on her way to Cape Breton, where I was born and raised, mm -hmm. and, I, and she would have been going to Sydney, and I'm sure she would have been looking at Whitney Pier. Mm -hmm. And it happened, you know, like the um, same year that I was born, you know. So you can't help but say, okay, this was all meant to be for me. So that's how I look at it. I say, this is God's call. Did I expect it? No. Um, so my dedication and devotion to her until God calls me home. What was it like? growing up in this province, knowing again the rich history of black people uh, in this province. And yet, you know, it took a while for, I think for this province and continues to take a while for the country to just open up and realize, almost maybe awaken to the fact that there is this forgotten group of people that played such an instrumental role in this country. Well, you know, the sad part of all of this is that I have to say, growing up, I didn't have that history. Mm. Um, my mother, who um, she didn't have um, high education, but she always did things like she was always reading, and she would continue reading a book to us all the time, but it was about America mm. because that's where they came from, and that's where she got the book from, right? So I, as I said, I did not hear Viola's name until I became an adult. And that's the sad part. So, but the stories that my family, my mom and my dad would talk to me about was all either something that happened in Africa or something that happened in the United States. But in Nova Scotia, I have to say, I don't recall that. And it wasn't until um, I became an adult and started working here in Halifax and went to school here in Halifax. I was also um, an x-ray technician and so forth. That's when it all hit. And, you, and, and when I think about it now, the number of African Nova Scotians who have done great, it's there. It's part of the history and that should be the history in all the schools across Canada. Not just the past people of African Nova Scotians who have done well, current African Nova Scotians who are doing exceptionally well. And that history should be part of all of Nova Scotians' history, and it's not.
And Canada. And Canada, history. yes. Not just Nova Scotia, Canada, and I would say international yeah. as well. Yvonne Atwell is one of those pioneers. The first black female member of the Legislative Assembly in this province, she won a seat in 1998, representing the area of Preston, a historically black community. I never thought that I couldn't do it because of my race. Mm. Um, why? I w why? Wh why? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I always felt that if you can do something, you do it. And it's not about what other people think you can or cannot do. If you know that you're going to do it, like what, what harm would it be to do it, to try it? Like, and I couldn't think of a reason why, why I couldn't do it, you know? I mean, I don't have a university degree, you know, all of those things, but none of that was important uh, to me at the time. It still isn't. It was just something I could do. I mean, what could possibly happen to me? You know, it's not that people, I'm sure behind my back, I was called many things, but. <laughs> Did you think at that time that you were a pioneer? Did you have space and room to actually think that I am pioneering New Frontier right now? No, I didn't think of it that way. You see, to me, if you begin to label what you're doing yourself, you won't be able to do it because you'll always look for other people to approve of what you're doing, okay? and to give you advice about what you're doing. And once that stuff is sort of is in your head, um, you may not be able to take the steps that you know you need to take. So I never thought about it that way, even though I know I was the first, but Wayne Adams was before me. He was the man, he was a black male, he was in the government. Uh, we never did make government when I was there. But I never thought of it as, um, and, and people ask me that all the time, and it, sometimes it almost feels as if I'm afraid to say how I felt or that I did something other than what I did. But, but I just went with, you know, what was in front of me, more or less. What was it like being, again, the first black woman as, as an MLA mm -hmm. in this province? Again, I, I find it fascinating, the rich history right. of African Nova Scotians in this province, and yet it took... 1998 for the first black woman. Oh, absolutely, yeah. When I won, I guess when I, when, I, when I won, I never thought beyond the fact that I could do something in my community to support what people were talking about or what they were saying. And so the views around racism, and there was lots of that, lots of that. there was newspaper articles, people said I was a one-time MLA, because uh, I used to fight for the fact that you, 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 we need more than one black MLA in this province. We have 52 black communities across this province. And whenever there's an issue, people look to me. Mm. Even and you people, can't represent all no. 52. Yeah. And not only that, people from across Canada would call me, you right. know. Wow. By the time her term was up, Yvonne Atwell says she had grown tired of the fight. But I found that I didn't have quite as much heart to, 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 to go back in that way. And then some of the players that I was with, some of the people who supported me, uh, some of the great people were no longer there, right? So it was kind of like finding new people, you know, new resources, new strengths. And because um, the communities themselves were also evolving at the same time. And so now there was white people running against me, in which they could. And if so it became more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. And even within that structure, there are stories mm -hmm. that I don't know if, I, if this is the place to talk about them, mm -hmm. about how I lost that seat. Mm -hmm. How I lost the seat that when, when, when the election was called was because people, more than one, who ran against me used other people mm -hmm. to ensure that the, that vote would split so I wouldn't get that seat. And it never went back. Wow. That's what's going to be After me, it never went back. Well, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. You pioneered, even if you want to believe it or not, Ms. Atwell, you okay. were a pioneer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm declaring you a pioneer. So you, you know, break down that wall. What, what, is, what does it look like today 
Is there more diversity? Yeah, it's, it, I think it, it wears you down in a different way. And I don't see after 25, must be 25, almost 30 years, we still don't have, you know, even in the city, we have uh, two counselors, two black counselors in the city of Halifax out of the whole 16, 17, you know? MLAs, in the, in the party right now, the conservative party, there's an 80, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's not good. It's still not good. So what does change look like for black Nova Scotians today? In December 2013, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 68 of 237, where it proclaimed 2015 to 2024 to be the international decade for people of African descent. Vanessa Fells is the Director of Operations for the Nova Scotia Decade for People of African Descent Coalition and eighth generation Canadian. So this is the second time I've actually uh, been to the United Nations, but the first time I ever spoke. And uh, my recommendations to all member states of the UN, and especially, of course, Canada, is that what's important um, has to go beyond symbolic gestures. And that it's not saying that those aren't important. We're ecstatic to have Emancipation Day, to recognize Viola Desmond on the $10 bill uh, for the recent apology in July to the number two construction battalion. The issue is, what is that doing to change policy and legislation? What, is the, what are those symbolic gestures, while amazing, what is that going to do to change the lives of African Canadians every single day? And the answer, other than having that recognition and having that sense of a positive self-esteem, which is excellent and it's much needed, it's still not going to change things when you're talking about justice and when you're talking about housing. Those things aren't really going to change because of it. And so my message to them was we need to do more in terms of legislation. We need to recognize African Canadians as people. Again, we've been here for 400 years. It's time that we have that recognition and that you see us as part of uh, a contributing uh, to Canadian society each and every day. We've only scratched the surface when it comes to the story, the history of African Nova Scotians in this country and in this province. But one thing is for sure, they've been here longer than this province. This country has existed and they've played such a crucial role in forming this country and what it is today. They truly are forgotten pioneers. Another thing has stood out to me, the injustice in how African Nova Scotians have been treated throughout the years and yet the determination to continue to stand strong, to continue to link arms as community, and to continue to be called Canadians and be a part of the fabric of this country is so clear in everything that we heard. Another thing that has stood out to me is what Miss Atwell, Miss Yvonne Atwell, the first black female MLA said, that at the end of the day, she never let what people thought of her stop her from what she felt called to do. What a lesson for the future. What a lesson for the next generation of Canadians in general, but especially black Canadians in this country. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think of today's topic. Join the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For all of us here, I'm Maggie John. See you next time. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Centre for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing context. You can write to Crossroads, PO Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs. Context Beyond the Headlines invites you to an exciting new season. This year, we're expanding our reach with a brand new podcast that will explore the interaction between faith, justice, culture, ethics, and society. As we move forward with this brand new season and the launch of this brand new podcast, would you consider partnering with Context financially? It is because of the generosity of viewers like you that we're able to continue to tell the stories that matter.